this discussion among technical experts who spoke only of that which they knew well was the main benefit the emperor sought in these meetings. Now we know what is meant by an administrative council, and it is easy to imagine its application to all kinds of matters. Those which Napoleon convened the most regularly were finance councils, commercial councils, provisions councils, engineering councils, artillery councils, councils of highways and public works, councils of naval works, councils of war administration, ETC. The engineering and highways councils were his favorites. He reviewed sometimes several times a year all the works underway in the empire, those in Alexandria, Antwerp, and Danzig, the interior canals, Alpine grades, Cherbourg's reservoirs, and improvements in Paris furnished him with inexhaustible details. The Minister of War was always present at the Administrative Councils on War, Engineering, and Artillery. For the Administrative Councils on War, Count Daru, Lacoue, Count of Sassac, Count Mathieu Dumas, the former officials of the Italian Army, Denier and Villemanzi and the Councillor State Marais, Director Provisions, were almost always summoned. When it was a question of fresh horses, General Broussier was called. In the commercial councils, it was Count Chaptal, Count Schauber, Director of the Bank, and Monsieur de Fermont, who, along with Ministers Montlivet and Collant de Soucy, threw light on the proceedings. A separate council each month saw to distributing the funds currently in the Treasury according to the needs of each minister to the public good. A balance was maintained there between payment authorizations and the means available to satisfy them. The heads of accounting sometimes had to appear for this work. The ministers of the interior, police and commerce, that is to say Count Montlivet and Duke de Rivigo Savary and Count Colant de Soucy, all three attended the provisions councils. Along with them, the emperor brought together Count Réunion de Saint-Jean d'Angely, president of the interior department of the Council of State, the state Councillor Rial, the State Councillor Marais, Director of War Provisions, Count Dubois, former Chief of Police, and Pasquier, current Chief of Police. All of them more or less familiar with the needs and the resources of the Parisian food market. The regulars at the artillery councils were the generals Sorbier, Gassendi, and La Riboisière. There the emperor found himself among comrades. Cassendi had been his captain. There was nothing sweeter or sometimes even happier than the intimacy that presided at this meeting. It was a family council. Colonel Evans, head of the artillery office of the war ministry, was there as clerk. The engineering committee also had its regulars. They were General Dijon, First Inspector, General Bertrand, the Emperor's aide-de-camp, General Chasse Lou Lau Ba, Director of Engineering Beyond the Alps, and the Council Allant, Major of Engineering, who was Secretary of the Fortifications Commission, and Major Decau, who directed the Engineering Office of the War Ministry. When Alexandria was discussed, General Chasseloup Loba had the floor. If it were a question of Antwerp, it was Colonel Sebatier who came to assess the work. General Haxo would hurry from deep in Germany or Spain. General Pointevin de Morillan came from Palmanova or the port of Kotor. All the officers directing the principal works filled through one after another. The highways and public works councils involved perhaps even more people. The permanent members of the council were the Minister of the Interior, Montalivet, and Count Molay, Director of the Highways Department. The minister brought with him the council, Briere, himself an engineer, who directed the public works office of the ministry. The other persons admitted varied according to the day's agenda. When it was a question of Paris or even canals or roads that ended there. The prefect of the Seine was always summoned. Each project brought its 
engineer. One by one, they laid out their plans and developed their estimates, defending their works, making their requests, and obtaining as much as possible. Sometimes it was Monsieur Scanzan in regard to seaports. Sometimes it was Monsieur Le Pair on the Loire canals. Sometimes Monsieur Seats on the navigation of the Rhine. Monsieur Sayar on the Alps. Monsieur Chirar on the waterways of Paris. Lastly, there were Messieurs Prony, Le Monde, Deschamps, Tarbet, and many other worthy men in submitting almost all the heads up branches of government to this difficult cross-examination for hours at a time. Napoleon learned as much about the men as about their projects. This was the key to how he was able to make such good choices and in delivering himself up in the intimacy of a work situation, he allowed them to appreciate the man within the emperor. And this was the secret of the entirely personal attachment that so many worthy men had for him. I see that I have omitted to name the persons who made up the finance councils. First, there were two ministers, Monsieur Godin, Duke of Gita, and Count Molian. Alongside them were Count de Fermont, President of the Financial Department of the Council of State and the Councillors of the State, Beringer and Jaubert. The Councillors of State, Louis and Corvetto, were sometimes called in their turn. And as in the other councils, we have already spoken up. The matter in question determined the choice of the rest of the participants. There were specialists on mortgages and tax registration. When this part of the public revenue was concerned, there were experts on land holdings. When the issues of domain were to be discussed, there was Count Lavalette. If the post office was to be dealt with, Count Francois de Nantes, if it was a question of indirect taxation. Always in these councils, as in the preceding ones, the department heads and technical experts were questioned or consulted. You have no doubt noticed that each minister was careful to bring with him to the council the colleague who could be most useful to him. The emperor on his side always had his secretary state with him. The last, accustomed to following the train of Napoleon's thought, kept minutes of the meeting. His writing and his signature lent proper authenticity to the resulting documents to be dispatched. The councils took up no less than five or six hours a day. It happened that the Duke of Bassano, overwhelmed with work, and I believe ill as well, was not able to attend them for some time. However, the emperor insisted on having someone with him, and the projects he was engaged in could not be interrupted. It was indispensable to find a substitute for the Secretary of State, but to introduce a newcomer in this position would only present difficulties for the emperor as well as for the Duke of Bassano. Murray, his thoughts turned to a man who was not the sort to gossip about his job, who had already worked closely with him in the cabinet, who had long been under the Duke de Bassano's command, and who was suitable for the work because of long familiarity with the secretarial office where he came from. I received the following letter from Meneval's hand. Monsieur Le Baron Fain, my intention is that for the time, my Secretary of State cannot attend administrative councils to take notes. You shall assume his place. You will submit to him all the minutes, which will be kept in the same ledgers. And if matters arise which must be sent to a minister in writing, you will show the dispatches to the Secretary of State. As this letter has no other purpose, I pray God to keep you in his holy care. Signed, Napoleon. This order to take my seat among the embroidered coats of the state had the immediate consequence of my being named Master Petitions. I was to be given my own embroidered coat. On the other hand, I could hardly be granted this external show of favor without a similar one being given to him whose subordinate I was in the interior. So my friend Menoval was also named Master Petitions. As of that moment, we left the private staff as the emperor had so far wanted us to keep. We were allowed to put away the bourgeois frock coats and a petition master's uniform became our regular dress. 
day, night in court, in the city, and on journeys. During the meetings where I held the pen, the emperor, surrounded by skillful superior men, seemed to me to exert an even greater intellectual superiority in all discussions. He was eminently the man of good judgment. It seemed to me that he was always right. In addition, this same testimony was constantly given him by the very men who had the honor of arguing against him, not perhaps regarding the point of view they had espoused, but for all others where they were disinterested observers. The highways and public works councils were principally those that I followed. Not having kept in my possession any of the notes that I took during these meetings, I will not attempt to reproduce the details. But some of the emperor's dominant ideas struck me, and I would like to set down my memory of them here. Napoleon always had his eye to the future and was the first to take into account the idea that events could occur, which would interrupt the works he embarked on each day. Therefore, he took every precaution first to avoid having his enterprises suspended by a temporary lack of funds in the public coffers. He had a system of special funds. In so far as possible, he provided each project with money that belonged to him personally and so kept it independent of many problems. Next, foreseeing the event that an interruption was inevitable, he wished at least that what had already been accomplished not be entirely lost. On this subject, he had several obsessions. Each year, his engineers and architects were to work towards completing parts of the whole. The tendency of most foremen to undertake work from all angles. It was was his horror. To begin everything, he would say, is to finish nothing. No one desired things finished more than he, so he saw to it with the greatest care that the money he granted was not scattered on too many things at the same time. During lengthy projects, he got impatient at seeing the initial funds and the early years lost in the premature assembling of materials. Preparations made on too large a scale, which in the event of accidental interruption, threatened to leave posterity with nothing but piles of framing lumber, building sites full of free stones and holes in the ground. A sad sight at the cost of great expense. I come now to the system with which the emperor armed himself against such consequences. To each sum he granted, he assigned a particular outcome. He wanted each work season to culminate in a finished product and for lengthy projects. He always had a clear and progressive ratio between the sums spent and the fraction of the work accomplished. Let us take some examples. Was a project to take 10 years? Each year was to draw on one-tenth of the total funds and produce one finished tenth of the whole work. Had he allowed a $25 million to improve a fortified town, the workers had better be careful not to hammer away indiscriminately on what existed and run the risk of having the whole place dismantled for the entire duration of the work. A war could intervene, and in that case, the money would have been spent to do harm rather than to do good. They were to follow a completely different course of action. Without jeopardizing the existing strength, they were to work to increase it. Each of the planned improvements, one after another, as the spending progressed, was to be introduced whole and complete into the old structure. Was it a question of creating a new fortification? Each million spent was to offer it a distinct degree of strength. First, a defensive ditch. Next, the high walls surrounding the site. Then afterwards, successively, the more advanced works. With this progression, the new site would be able to offer the rudiments of a defense as soon as the initial work was done. If only as an entrenched position in the second work stage it would acquire the strength of a walled city and from year to year it would gain 10 days 20 days 30 days of additional defense of use since the first ditch it would thus arrive decree by decree at the intended level of defense if it were a question of architecture it was again the same system napoleon undertook the second gallery of the louvre but after having settled the plans for the whole he wanted the architect to execute it by spans if i cannot complete it said he 
At least I don't want to leave behind me a long line of unfinished pillars waiting sadly upright to be crowned by their vault and the rest of the building. The view from the carousel will be beautified by as many complete arches as I was able to erect and the Tuileries will benefit from this wing sooner than the Louvre. For a canal, canal or road, he laid down the same conditions. Once the layout of a canal had been well studied, he wished that it would be completely open at an initial point and the point carried forward without interruption, in each case finishing the section that had been begun so that the first connection would be lengthened each year as much as the work would allow. It is better, he would say, to achieve a canal of 10 leagues every 10 years than to have to wait a century for a canal of a 100 leagues to be finished. If it were a question of putting in a new road, what good was it to dig the whole length of it at once? It was to unroll like a ribbon in increments of six feet over the terrain to be leveled. In this way, each year, the connection stretched from one town to another. And the completed work was in use independent of that which remained to be done. I have said enough about this. It was always the same concept, wearing different faces. You know now as well as I do that the emperor wished in every enterprise for the public to profit from the expenditure as immediately as possible. Certainly in some locations and in the nature of certain types of work, this system encountered obstacles requiring that it be modified. But after all, for the engineers and architects. It was the emperor's law. If this strong will did not always succeed in overcoming every resistance, at least it succeeded in triumphing over most. The meetings I found the most interesting were those devoted to the affairs of the city of Paris. I am a Parisian, and those meetings made a strong impression on me. However, do not believe that my intention is to reprise here all that I saw commissioned in the way of embellishments and public works. It would never end, and in any case, would be pointless, because what Napoleon did for Paris strikes everyone's eyes today and speaks far louder than the pages of a book. But it is not well known that this wealth of the capital cost little or nothing to the state's treasury. I will only pull from my memories of these councils of Paris some quick glimpses to give a clear idea of this. The emperor lent to the city of Paris only the clarity of his vision and the strength of his good administration. To illustrate the motivating force he provided to this great municipal machine, the matter of the poor houses which was handled in my presence will suffice among a thousand examples. For some time, these homes providing for the ill and needy had insufficient revenues. Although handsomely endowed, they had fallen into the city's keeping. Relations between the poor houses and the city were strained. The emperor, by a simple transfer of property, changed them to such an extent that the city no longer had to exhaust its funds to aid the poor houses and the houses on the contrary were able to provide revenues for the city here is how the hotel Dieu, long established landlord that it was could boast of possessing the oldest houses in paris and year by year these relics fell into a state that absorbed almost all the money they could bring in certainly no property could be more hideous or expensive and yet people of scruples held to them. They were the property of the poor. It was the trust that the charity of our ancestors left in posterity's keeping. They cannot be changed. No one can be permitted to touch them. The emperor took a larger view. To his eyes, the unfaithful guardian was time, which had destroyed the trust in reducing it to almost nothing. There was no administrator intelligent enough to restore to the grant the value that it had lost. Firm in his belief, he issued orders. And this insistence, I remember, almost caused an uprising. The prefect himself, the honest for show, had hesitated for a moment. You will sell these old buildings, said the emperor, because they are a source of expense and no longer of revenue. And the poor need money, not expenses. You will sell all these old houses that de Mortmain has throttled in its grip. And in selling them to the private sector, you will be returning them to the market of productive property. In selling them, you will realize a capital which, instead of a fictional revenue, 
will give you real revenue, a revenue of 5% clear of all expenses, which can be raised to an even better rate. The city of Paris borrows at 5% to do its works. Cannot the poor houses first provide this capital, which will result from the sale of their buildings, with the goal of later replacing them and at the same time become proprietors of these beautiful markets, these immense warehouses whose products will always increase. The rents in the marketplaces are supported by precisely this class of people for whom the homes most often make up their beds of suffering. The new destination of the funds will lighten the burden and the rent collected by the poor houses will seem no more than a tax levied on work against times of misery and illness. This is how Napoleon spoke of municipal affairs. These beautiful speculations did not remain in the lofty province of planning. They touched ground and were realized, but without fanfare almost unnoticed, and it seems to me I'm the first to speak of it. Then let me also be the first to speak of his great system of clearing up as applied to the improvements in Paris. Praise is never lacking for the construction. Demolitions also have their merit, but they are quickly forgotten because they disappear beneath the creations that replace them. Let us say that the hovels of poor houses were not the only ones of which Napoleon had cleared the streets of Paris, and we owe him many more debts of this sort. To beautify Paris, he said, there is more to be demolished than to be built. How else can we show off to advantage all these structures that until now we seem to have taken pleasure in hiding? All these tiny streets so carefully shut off from sun and cold, where in former times there were large courts and gardens giving space for fresh air, it is urgent to disinfect them with great currents of air now that all the spaces in between are filled and overflowing. What was space enough for the traffic of donkeys and beasts of burden, horses led by hand and mules? How could it be sufficient for the traffic of our long and wide harnesses, our large coaches, and our heavy carts? Is there not something to be done here? After having for so long backed down in the face of necessity, it is hardly possible to postpone action any longer. Under peril of suffocation, we must empty out this too dense enclosure. The ant hill is smothering. For example, why not knock down this whole section of Ile de la Cité? It's a fast ruin, no longer good for housing anything. But the rats of old Letitia. Here, this old rubble can't be expensive to raise as that which clutters up the carousel, and a few millions spread over a few years could take care of it. I would like staggered rows of trees planted on this site like those in the Champs-Élysées. It would be the most beautiful walk in Paris. The Basilica of Notre Dame and the old Palace of St. Louis, consecrated to justice, would make a majestic adornment. The disgraceful key of scrap iron will soon have a new look. In general, these beautiful terraces that form our Parisian keys should be better cleared out, bordered on one side by the flow of the river. On the other side, they deserve to be lined with the most beautiful houses in the city. The display of our major public squares should also or or offer a regular view of only the houses of highest value. Such sites must assuredly Invite land speculation, the increase in capital resulting from the transformation of the current houses to first-class houses offers a sure guarantee to all loans. Look at Place Vendôme. Look at Place de Victoire. Imagine the public square that could be made in front of Saint-Sulpice and calculate whether in the difference between what exists and what could be, there is not the means to handsomely pay all the costs of these improvements. Why shouldn't the city pay a part in every enterprise of this nature? Couldn't a partnership be formed between those who own the property in its current state and the city, which guaranteeing the project, first of all, would assure the owners of the revenue they already enjoy, while reserving for itself at a profit the additional value the house will have acquired. Each transaction would be settled separately and not mixed up with the others. Once the public square or the facade undertaken is finished, the city would sell its interest in 
the property and in getting back its loans and profits could reinvest them in another. A swarm of ideas of this sort sparkled in the conversations that the emperor had with his counselors, those which he was not able to put into effect are perhaps not lost for the future. The emperor himself took care to preserve the plants. We are already familiar with the logistic organization that he brought to all his projects, so it is not astonishing to learn that everything of importance which was said in the administrative councils was briefly summed up in the minutes of the meeting. This document sent the same evening to the minister executing the work became for him a faithful reminder and a fertile test for all the secondary instructions he had to give. As for the minutes, they were carefully transcribed into a ledger, and the ledgers filled this in this manner number a great many. This stack of minutes of the Secretariat of State remains like a monument erected to the memory of Napoleon, the administrator. Another monument, no less precious, can be found in the minutes of the council of state meetings presided over by the emperor. The Council of State met regularly on Tuesdays and Fridays. When the emperor attended, he came no later than two o'clock. The general colonel of the guard, the aide-de-camp, and the chamberlain accompanied him there. He left by the cabinet of the great apartment and went down the central staircase, then crossed the vestibule of the chapel. The council of state was held on this side. Let us go for a moment into that part of the palace. Chapter 14, the council of state. I believe that all the time of the empire, hardly anyone and all the world suspected what Napoleon's Council of State was. Do we know any better today? To seek in this council a power which controlled the master, which quashed the capricious acts of his ministers, and so rendered the yoke less unbearable, is to greatly misjudge the times and the people. We glimpse that somewhere in the early plans of the consulate, but is having read a program enough to have a clear idea of what really ensued? There is not one of our institutions which, down to its smallest details, does not offer notable differences between what is supposed to be and what is. This was true of the Council of State. You may look in the letter of the law for what it was supposed to be. I will tell you what it was. It was not a power. It was a supplement to administrative thought. It was a council in the true sense of the word, having no movement or action, but the impetus received from the emperor it only advised when the emperor said to it, advise me, only concerned itself with matters on which it was consulted. Its task was to enlighten the emperor on the advantages or drawbacks of the proposals made by the ministers, suggesting amendments or improvements to plans, but offering only opinions. Such was the official nature of its deliberations and the true object of its work. It was ordinarily at the end of the Council of Ministers that the Emperor sorted out those ministerial proposals on which he wished to consult his council before making up his mind. It was by the intermediary of the Secretariat of State that the files came to the Secretariat of the Council. Plans for laws, plans for rules of public administration, and in the case of administrative litigation, all appeals made to the Emperor for further inquiry made up the first class of work that the Emperor reserved for the Council of State. But many other files of a secondary interest were sent to it daily, such as all the matters of national domain, exchanges, transfers, or acquisitions of local districts. Matters of the same nature for parishes, city budgets, rates of city tolls, ETC. Finally, a long-standing custom ended with the establishment of categories of affairs for which preliminary reference to the Council of State was understood. The determination was ordinarily made by the minister in charge of the subject. Often the emperor set the process in motion himself. In the first instance, the minister would make a report and append it to his suggested ruling. In the second instance, the emperor would have a suggested ruling 
drawn up by his minister or without an intermediary would dictate it himself. But in whatever way the proposal had been made, as soon as it was in a condition to be presented, it was sent by the Secretary of State to the Secretary of the Council of State. And this latter transmitted it to the department in charge of that work. Five permanent committees within the Council of State were occupied with all the preparatory work. These committees were called departments. There was a department for legislation, one for internal administration, and one for finances. The fourth was for war, and the fifth for the Navy. Only five or six councillors of state formed the nucleus of each department. The emperor appointed them every three months, but apart from a few transfers, the personnel making up the departments experienced few changes, and this custom of having the same people in the same positions had imperceptibly introduced into each question an administrative precedent that helped in the expedition of matters by lending continuity and constancy to the decisions. Each department was chaired by the member indicated on the trimester's list. There were equally few variations in these choices except for the interval of Monsieur Bigot de Priamenu's presidency. Monsieur Bollet de la Murta normally presided over the legislative department. Monsieur de Fermont always chaired the finest department. Monsieur Regnon de saint Angeli, succeeding Monsieur Roderay in 1802, remained henceforward president of the interior department. Monsieur Lacoué left the presidency of the war department only to become minister. And it was Monsieur Andriassi who replaced him. Lastly, Admiral Gentillon, Monsieur de Fleurieu's successor in the Navy Department presided from 1801 to the end. With the exception of this last, the department chairs had one by one obtained the title of Minister of the State, and the Emperor called them his petite ministres. With each department's work, when it had been accomplished, it was returned to the Emperor in Cases of emergency, the department chair could submit it himself. To this end, he had entree and would appear at the levee. But for all ordinary matters, the submission took place by the intermediary of the Secretary of State. The emperor praised himself of the observations or amendments presented and did one of two things. Either he abandoned the proposal or he followed up on it. In the later case, the matter was sent back to the General Assembly of the Council. But first, if in any case the alterations had some importance, the minister was consulted by a communique from the Secretary of State. The difference of opinion would lead to a discussion. The minister supporting his point of view, either directly to the emperor or at a meeting of the Council of State. The meeting began at noon. In the absence of the emperor, it was the arch-chancellor who presided, and the meeting finished at dinner time at the latest. The matters on the day's agenda were printed in advance so that the ministers could consider them prior to the discussion, but distribution was made only to those who were deliberate on the issue. The department would have a report of the matter made by one of its members, and this report was almost always made verbally. When the discussion had exhausted itself, a vote was taken. Each counselor raised his hand for or against. The opinion of the council was determined was subject to approval. If the emperor had been present at the deliberation, he normally made his decision in the course of his private work with the Secretary of State. According to the text of the law, the council's opinion could be given to the emperor by the Secretary General. But in reality, it was always through the intermediary of the Secretary of State that Mr. Locre acquitted himself of this task. The emperor then made use of whatever suited him of the council's opinions, rejecting them, approving them as they were presented to him, or using them with modifications. In any case, it was enough that the council of state had been heard. In general, the Council of State's tasks of administrative details of a secondary order did not offer much of interest. Codes were not being made every day, and more than half a year elapsed without the Emperor having come to preside. But the brilliant aspect of the Council of State's existence lay more in its personal composition than in the ordinary work with which 
This elite gathering amused itself while waiting for chores more worthy of it. For the emperor, there was more to the council state than just the opinion factory whose mechanism we have just seen in the same way that Napoleon was accustomed to offering his scientific ideas to the members of the Institute, he needed other sorts of commentators to whom he could express his lofty ideas of government, organization, and administration. He needed eloquent men to speak to the Senate and legislative galleries in his name, skilled writers, and knowledgeable publicists who were no less necessary to him. Just as among his aides de camp, he had experienced generals quick to understand a new maneuver from the first word and skilled in rushing to execute it under enemy fire on the civil side. He needed statesmen just as skilled at seizing his thoughts, just as swift at going anywhere. The administration had need of extra impetus. He also needed to rally some of the statesmen who remained from earlier times, solid traditions, useful information and advice based on experience acquired in the handling of great issues are not to be disdained. Finally, in order to proceed with the general revision of all the laws of public administration, each branch offered professionals. As experienced as they were learned, the emperor liked technical advisors, but they had to be dragged from their ruts. Napoleon worked constantly to bring together around him all these varieties of statesmen, and the Council of State was the title and the banner under which he kept them enlisted. A single thought motivated the emperor in his choices. It was the need of surrounding himself with men who could be of use to him, ignoring party prejudices without going into past situations, opinions, or cliques, which might have led to each one's fame. He held only to reorganizing the skill which could yet serve him with integrity. Almost all Napoleon's counselors of state, independent of their political prominence, had a well-established, exceptional reputation of experience and knowledge in their particular fields. And as one does not become knowledgeable without much work, they were all hard workers. And as one speaks easily of that which one knows well, they were almost all compelling orators when on their own turf. In this way, the emperor had been able to assemble the most diverse aptitudes at his disposal. Orators, publicists, apprentice ministers, acting superintendents, special administrators, scrupulous liquidators, jurists, bureaucrats, diplomats, men of the pen, and the sword at once. Economists and merchants, all the superior personal skills he wished to bring into play were available to him in this council. But in Napoleon's longer view, after having satisfied the present, it was necessary to think of the future. It was not enough that this selection of superior men form a reserve corps for the present administration. They must also collect a following. All the sciences of government could find skilled teachers there. By instituting auditors, Napoleon saw to it that these masters had pupils. I am raising administrators for the future. They are for Formed in the workshop of rules and laws. There they penetrate our principles and maxims of public order, ever surrounded by good advice and good judges, whether under the eyes of the government or on important missions. They come to public office one by one with the maturity of experience and the certainty that only proven character and knowledge can give. Statement of position. Year Twelve. The auditors were thus the breeding ground that was to produce the secondary functionaries of the administration. They completed their education through experience of men and things. One day, Napoleon would say, they will take over all the posts in the empire. Las Casas. The petition masters formed an intermediary class in the council between the auditors and the counselors. They were men ready to advance in their careers to be mere pupils, while the auditors became young administrators, the elite of the already mature administrators took over. 
the petition master's positions. They were counselors of state of small stature. They already had the trappings. The emperor tested the members of his council of state and used them for everything. Often it was not without a particular aim that he sounded them on one subject or another. To have a man examine a question, said he, is a sure way to know his strength, study his political tendencies, and even test his discretion. Napoleon found in his council the means of resolving one of the greatest difficulties of government, that of choosing individuals to serve it. The political question is, in fact, more personal than is believed, and often it is the servants that make the master's merits or his faults. Here, the master avoided, in so far as possible, the ordinary disadvantage of appointing untried men. At the very least, those with reputations for complacence, claims of favor, and political connections had to pass through a candidacy which brought out their deeper worth. So Napoleon named only men he knew personally, at least by sight, if they were older men. He had tried them if they were young people. They came from his school and from under his wing, so to speak. Service alone then brought about each one's destiny. The General Assembly of the Council of State counted barely 40 to 50 members in presence including the petition masters. However, that number was much greater overall. More than 100 persons carried the title of counselor of state under Napoleon. More than 50 were petition masters. The number of auditors, which greatly increased in the later years, passed 400. And if you also count the foreigners incorporated into the council, following the German, Italian, and Dutch mergers with the empire, you will find that the staff of the Council of State under Napoleon rose to more than 600. But most of them were far away from the council on missions, in army work, in embassies, in administrative organization, or in private posts where diligence to duty did not permit them to attend meetings. The 30 or 40 members who attended the deliberations made up what was called the regular branch. There was the regular branch within the departments, which we have already spoken of, and the regular branch outside the departments. In this last category were found some councillors of state detached from the council but employed in Paris, whose presence could be useful for general assemblies. In this number were his general directors. The prefect of the Senate, the chief of police, the counselors of the state from the foreign relations office, and those who belong to the court of cassation. With these exceptions, all those who were employed outside the council were inscribed on a list. And this was the special branch.